the feast of unleavened bread. Last week I started on the feast of Israel. It's one of the most marvelous things that ever happened to me studying the book of Leviticus. Exciting, eh? Book of Leviticus. But I'll show you something marvelous as to how God orchestrated events in history. And uh, there's a great detail about this feast in, uh, in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. But Leviticus is what I want to focus on. And Leviticus chapter 1, verse, uh, chapter 23, verse 1 and 2 says, uh, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feast of the Lord which you, you shall proclaim to be holy are convocations, and these are my feasts. These feasts were not designed by people. These feasts were designed by God himself. God calls them. They are his feasts, and they need to com commemorate them. And the original Hebrew word for the holy convocation is the word movar and migra, which means to keep an appointment or the word rehearsal. God said, I give you feasts as a rehearsal. So what is this rehearsal? What are we talking about here? For example, last week we saw the Feast of Passover. Every time God gave them the Feast of Passover, He told them every year they have to sacrifice, uh, sacrifice a blemishless lamb. And we talked about how Christ, it was pointing to Christ who was the blemished lamb. And every year they did it, and even to the day it was so accurate. Let me tell you this, around 9 o'clock is when Christ uh, was bound to the cross, and around 3 o'clock He died in the afternoon. That was the day of Passover, the day where the sacrifice is blemished lambs is when he was crucified on the cross. And interestingly, in, interestingly enough, when they the, took the blemished lamb at nine o'clock in the morning, they tied it down to an altar. The lamb, the true lamb of God was tried, tied to the cross at exactly at nine o'clock. And at three o'clock when all these sacrifices are done, the high priest gives out a call and says, it is finished. And Christ, when he was dying on the cross, he cried out, it is finished. You see the pattern? You see the rehearsal? You see how, how, how God orchestrated everything? So we need to develop well into these mysteries and uh, understand what, it, what this all means. They have prophetic significance, commemorative significance of a historical situation. There are implications for a believer. Everything applies to us. And there are all kinds of treasures in the Old Testament we shouldn't ignore as New Testament believers. And the Bible talks in, uh, in Colossians, Paul is talking to the church of Colossae and says, chapter 2, verse, six, verse 16, he says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink in regarding to a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are the shadow of the things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Paul says, let no one judge you because you follow the feasts and stuff. Because this is all pointing to something. This is the shadow of the things to come. And all is pointing to Christ. He wants every believer to be aware of this. And how, how well are we aware of these things, my friends? And as a church, we have neglected so much about the Judaism or the Jewishness of Christ. We, we neglected the Old Testament of Christ. It's important to understand the foundations. I was, as I was saying last time, there's a new meaning and there's a supernatural engineering of the scriptures that God orchestrated 66 books, 40 different authors. We cannot neglect a jot or a tittle. We cannot neglect even a little um, uh, uh, a dot or any kind of thing in the scriptures. Everything is very, very important. And the calendars, they came into existence. There were 15 calendars in the ancient times, believe it or not, 15 types of calendars. And one of them is the Jewish calendar. And interestingly enough, they have two kinds. I was talking about it last time, the civil calendar. It starts with the month of Tishri and the religious year to start with the month of Nisan. And I was talking about how they have 360 days in a year. It's very important for us to remember. And it's amazing how God follows everything according to the Jewish calendar. And actually, the calendars came into existence around 701 BC. I don't know, you do some research. They began to change calendars. I don't know what happened, but something happened in 701 BC that calendars began to change. And in 1582, Pope Gregory the 13th gave uh, this calendar that we follow called the Gregorian calendar, I think. It says 365 days, 365 one fourth days, which we follow. But God followed in the Bible this calendar, which is the Jewish calendar, the religious year and the civil year. The month of Nisan is this. This is where the Nisan 14th is the feast of Passover, which we looked at. So there are uh, seven feasts in total, three spring feasts and three fall feasts. The Passover, unleavened bread, and the first fruits come under spring, fall feasts, trumpets, adornment, and tabernacles are in between. There is a feast of Pentecost. So 
Interestingly enough, all these feasts, all scripture is written about Christ. Everything points to Jesus Christ. So the first three feasts, believe it or not, talk about the first coming of Jesus Christ and the, and the Pentecost to trumpets talk about the church age, which is our time right now, this time of the church. And again, there's the second coming, the fall holidays talk about the second coming of the Lord, which we'll see as time goes by. Let me get into a little detail here about the Passover lamb. You might, uh, you might, th- you might say, okay, how is this relevant for us uh, as believers? And God predicted in Exodus, he says, uh, there'll be a death of a firstborn. This is what he says, Exodus chapter 4, 22 to 23. This is what the Lord says. Uh, God is telling Moses, then you shall say to Pharaoh, um, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say, say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your firstborn. And God gives an, uh, a mandate for the Jewish people and all the people in the land. He says, if you put the blood of the lamb on your doorposts, I will pass over your house and there will not be death of the first one. And here is the thing. Listen to this interesting thing. If if an Egyptian man had blood on his door, his firstborn was saved. But if a Jewish man didn't have blood on his door, his firstborn died. You following? If an Egyptian man, Egyptian family had blood on the doorpost, they were saved. Their firstborn was saved. But if the Jewish man didn't have blood on the doorpost, their firstborn died. What does that tell you? That God is not a God of partiality. He even cared for the Gentiles. And the ultimate factor that it lies in is in the blood of the Lamb. God, what he looks through is Christ and nothing else. It might be nations, tongues, and tribes, whatever. It doesn't show partiality. The ultimate factor it boils down to is the blood of the Lamb. And God showed that in the past. And guess what? This 14th of Nisan was the day when Egypt, uh, the, the Israelites left the land of Egypt. And the 14th of Nisan, you know, according to the Jewish, uh, Egyptian calendar, what it falls on? Velikovsky, uh, another historian, did some work on when does this 14th of Nisan fall according to the Egyptian calendar. You know what day it falls on? Friday the 13th. Interesting, eh? Anyway, so why is that? Uh, People are surprised somewhere. Anyway, anyway, there's a blood sacrifice that is required. Why do people need blood sacrifices? You know, Bible says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. In the original Hebrew, the soul is in the blood. That's why God, when you want atonement to the souls, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is in the blood that makes the atonement for the soul. That's why blood sacrifices were required, and the true lamb of God we saw, Jesus, was the Passover lamb. He's the true ultimate sacrifice, a sacrifice, a redeemer for mankind. So we move on to the next feast, which is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and it's the very next day they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's very close. The next day, 15th of Nisan, is when they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, very close proximity to the Feast of Passover. Now, what is leaven? Leavened bread, what is unleavened, what is leaven, what, so we need to understand that. The leaven, leaven means yeast. Did I say it right? I have a hard time between yeast and yeast. Right? I was trying to ask Sarah, she told me a long time back. So, so I say yeast, so don't worry about the yeast. It's, the, it's this yeast I'm talking about this morning, okay? So leaven is yeast, unleavened bread is bread without yeast. So what happened according to the scripture? Exodus chapter 12, verse 39. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had bought out from Egypt. For it was not leavened because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor they had, to prepare, uh, nor they had prepared provisions from themselves. God said, pack up, let's go. So he was in a hurry. So Egyptians, uh, when the Israelites, they had to make this dough, their provisions. They were packing their lunch. Uh, they didn't have McDonald's then, so they couldn't get a fast food stuff. So they had to bake something. So what they did, they took this dough and they packed it and they left. And the next day, the 15th of Nisan, when they made it, they had this bread, which, which was crunchy because it had no yeast in it. That's why it became the, the, the time of unleavened bread. And then God gives an ordinance for them to remember this feast of unleavened bread. What does it say? We'll see the, uh, Leviticus chapter 23, 4 to 8 as we read. These are the Lord's appointed feasts, sacred assemblies that God was talking about in verse 5. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th, 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of the month, the Lord's uh, feast of unleavened bread begins. For seven days, you must eat bread without yeast. For uh, on the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. For seven days, present offerings ma- made to the Lord by fire. On the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. 
So God gave a mandate for the Israelites. What were they supposed to do? Let me summarize what the Israelites had to do. Number one, this feast had to be done for seven days. They had to eat unleavened bread, bread without yeast, for seven days in total, from the 15th of Nisan to the 21st. And then they had to make unleavened bread for this time. Not only that, they had a a gathering, a holy convocation, an assembly on the first day, and the seventh day they had to give offerings made by fire, and they're not supposed to do any kind of work, and this needs to be observed through all generations. Even today, if you go to a Jewish home, they do something else, is they clear leaven from the houses, which I'll tell you the significance about. This is what it looks like in a Jewish home every time the Feast of Unleavened Bread occurs. The father of the household, what they do, the parents, they hide yeast in small portions around the house, and the kids and the parents that go around the house to find where this yeast is. And what they do, the father lights a candle with a candle and a feather and a wooden spoon and a paper bag, and uh, they collect this leaven and, and, and then burn it out eventually. This is what happens. I'll tell you the significance of all these things, why they do that and what does it, how does it point to Christ and stuff. So let's get into leaven. Let, let me give you a little bit of a, a scientific lesson right now. Leaven, yeast, is an invisible uh, uh, invisible microbe, invisible to the naked eye. A microbe is something that you cannot see with the naked eye. That's what is called a microorganism. It has a remarkable fermenting ability. So ladies, when you bake something, you got to know all these scientific parts, all right? All right, no, I'm just kidding. You don't need to know. As long as you keep making good stuff like what you did today, we have no problems whatsoever. So here is 11. So this has remarkable fermenting ability, and it causes the batter to rise, and it exists everywhere, all, all in the nature. An original baking process started 4,000 years ago, and interestingly enough, it started with the Egyptians. Believe it or not, they are the kings of baking. They are the first people. So what is the equation? Starch with the yeast, carbon dioxide, and alcohol. C6H12O6, you know, with the help of yeast, act like, act like a catalyst, gives carbon dioxide and alcohol. You know, gas problems, real gas problem happens with the yeast because that's what converts the stuff. And now let me tell you something. What is leaven compared to in the Bible? Many times when Christ talks about leaven, he compares it with sin. Leaven is compared to sin. This yeast is compared to sin. But only once it talks, Christ compares it to the kingdom of God. But most of the time, the majority of the time, 99% of the time, he compares it to sin. Now, let's think as if we're reading leavened bread and unleavened bread this morning. Leaven means with yeast, which is sin, with sin, okay? And without leaven, sinless. Let's see the taste, okay? Imagine this. Let your taste buds start working now. Sin with leaven. You like bread with yeast? Yeah, it's tasty. Very appealing, all puffed up and juicy, butter on the top. I'm not making you hungry. Okay, let's move on. You know, you crave for more and it permeates and you see how beautiful this loaf of bread is. I'm trying to learn how bread is made and Sarah says if it's soft, it's good, right? I learned that. Anyway, so if it's sinless, imagine. Without leaven, it's flat like a cardboard, it's distasteful, unappealing, no real craving for it and, and there's no permeation. Now let me tell you this, as a Christian, when we become a Christian, why does God want to walk in such a distasteful manner? Who said sin is not tasty? Bible clearly shows that sin is tasty. Sin is tasty in the beginning, but it consequences, its consequences are bitter. Right? So that's what the thing is. And God says, you got to celebrate this feast of unleavened bread. And he gives this mandate to the Israel. So why does he give this mandate? Because the scripture says in Deuteronomy 16.3, you shall eat no leaven uh, bread with it. Seven days you'll, you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is the bread of affliction. God wants us to remember what you've been through. They've been through so much torture and slavery in Egypt. And whenever you want to understand the significance of God, God's deliverance, you need to see in the light of the bondage. Whenever you want to understand the light, you need to understand what darkness is. And we need not be taught because there is darkness all over. We're born in sin. But once we understand the deliverance, we'll understand what God's grace has shown. That's why God wanted them to remember where you came from. God wants you to remember how your past was. Even though the, Egypt, uh, the Israelites, when they were in Egypt, probably they're eating leavened bread, and all of a sudden God gives them a mandate to eat unleavened bread. Here they cross the Red Sea, and they were eating the unleavened bread. You know what the feeling is? 
Even though they're eating the most disgusting meal of their lifetime, they're eating it in better cir- circumstances. Don't you think? They're eating the best in be- they're eating the distasteful thing in the best of the circumstances. We as believers can be having the greatest stuff, but in a sinful lifestyle, it won't be tasty. But once you are delivered by Christ, even with the little things that you got, you'll have a meaningful life. Somebody said all the rich people, you know, they have all the toys in the world, but somebody said only God gives them the batteries. You can have all the toys in the world, but only God gives the batteries, right? You can have everything that you can possess, but only joy comes from the Lord. Only the meaningful existence, the life abundant, the joy overflowing, the peace that passes all understanding comes from Christ and Christ alone. And your circumstances may be bleak this morning. Maybe you're going through financial struggles, health problems, this thing and that thing. It might be the most distasteful time in your life. But let me tell you, God is working something wonderful. In this distasteful means, you're experiencing the riches of God. You can face circumstances as a person who eats leavened bread, or you can face circumstances as a person who eats unleavened bread. The leaven that Israelites faced was slavery, oppression, the servitude. And Bible calls the sin. We are, we are slaves to say sin easily and snares us. Hebrews 12, 1. We are slaves to sin, but God sets us free. My friends, this morning I urge you, you need to have the desire to leave Egypt. You need to have the desire to eat unleavened bread, even though it's distasteful. We need to move on from our circumstances of compromise and say, okay, I'm going to have a little bit of that and a little bit of this. If you want the true meaning of life, you need to have the thrust in your heart that I need to get away from here. Christ said, I am the bread of life. He's the true bread of life. What does that signify? He's the sinless bread of life. He's the unleavened bread of life. In Corinthians, Christ says, Christ's sinlessness is mentioned in uh, chapter 5, verse 21. For he, for he made him, that is God made him, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. He became an object of sin. Christ was not a sinner, but the sin was dumped on one man, and he became an object of curse. That's why God had to judge. And also 1 John 3, 5 says, And you know that he was manifested to take away his sins, and in him there is no sin. There is no sin in Christ. So what is the gospel message according to the unleavened bread? Is we need to put away our sin and take in the end. God imputes the sinlessness, sinlessness of Christ. We take the leaven out and take in the unleavened Christ, the uncorrupted Christ. And you know, again, Scripture confirms this uh, gospel message. Where was Christ born? Right from there, everything reflects to the bread of life. That is Christ Jesus. Where was he born? In a town called Bethlehem. Beth means house, house of bread. Christ was born in Bethlehem, which means house of bread. So everything, it signifies we need to be a partaker uh, of this unleavened bread. Now, how does this apply to us as a believers? Us and the unleavened bread, how does this signify? Number one, unleavened bread feast uh, follows the feast of Passover. Or Passover precedes unleavened bread. Without having the lamb's blood sacrificed for your sins, you cannot be a partaker of Christ. Without confessing your sins, without having Jesus Christ as your Savior, you cannot be a partaker and have communion with him. First Passover, second comes unleavened bread. And Passover talks about what Christ did for us. And unleavened bread talks about what Christ is to us. And you see, there's redemption in Passover and this communion in unleavened bread. And Passover is an act of God. Unleavened bread is, are the effects of the act. We are sanctified, my friends. When we are justified through the blood of Christ, we are sanctified. This process of our whole lifestyle is is a process of sanctification and ultimately will be glorified. Justified, process of sanctification, ultimate glorification. This is what a believer passes through. Let's get back a little more upon this leaven. Again, another biology lesson. Be ready now. Properties of leaven. What is leaven? The prominent idea of leaven is corruption. 
It changes the particles that it comes in contact with. This little microbial organism, when it comes in touch with this uh, flower, dough, whatever, it, it changes its texture. It, it is clear, hidden, silent, and it's mysterious. It's all pervading and has a transforming action. Sin, nobody wants to start off like a big sinner. Everybody starts off in a small way, like the little invisible way. The sin enters life. You, put, you want to put your toe in the whirlpool and say, oh yeah, let me see how it is. Pretty soon, pretty soon you'll realize you're neck down in the water. That's how addiction starts. That's how things start. My friends, sin is very dangerous. It can drag you in. You'll, you'll, without your knowledge, you'll be see, seeing there's so how did I end up here? That's the property of leaven. Have you ever seen a loaf of bread? which is only half raised and half didn't? No, it doesn't take long, does it? Right? It spreads very quickly. The secret, hidden, mysterious thing just spreads. And that's what sin is. And Christ wants us to be aware and be unleavened. What, is, what specifically was he saying about unleavened bread? We'll see in Matthew 16, 6, Jesus talks about uh, the leaven and says, Jesus said to them, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What was the leaven? of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaven of wrong doctrine. Evil communications, my friends, corrupt good morals. Theology, all this knowledge that you acquire of God needs to permeate in your life. And when it permeates, your lifestyle will will reflect what you believe. And here is an important point. If you listen to wrong doctrines, if you build your life on false theology, your life will reflect it because Bible compares it, Christ compares it to the leaven of the Pharisees. We need to be very careful, especially in the last days where people are preaching for tickling people's ears, when the doctrine is diluted and corrupted and say Jesus loves everybody, yes, but he's also holy God. When they take only certain aspects of God, they're diluting the stuff. They're manipulating with God's word, and that's dangerous. And when you have such kind of teaching in your life, it'll corrupt you. And when it corrupts you, you'll be like a whole loaf, which is... uh, not biblical. It's a wrong leaven of wrong doctrine, which is not safe. And later, later on, it talks about in Mark 8, 8 15, talks about, uh, and uh, uh, Jesus talks to the people and says, and he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Leaven of Herod? What is that leaven? Herod was a political ruler. He wanted favors from Rome, he wanted the praises of men. It talks about the worldliness. We need to be careful as not to become people pleasers. When it comes to the truth, you need to stand for the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's very important, my friends, not to compromise with the truth. There's a leaven of wrong doctrine, which is very scary. There's a leaven of what is called worldliness and the hypocrisy. And the third one is the leaven of pride. This is the most dangerous of all, I think. The reason why a prideful person will never go for confession. I'm not talking Catholic sense. I'm saying he'll never admit that he's wrong. That is, that's, that, that's the result of a pride. And the most important thing of a leaven, how does leaven or the yeast change the dough into bread? By what? The simple process of puffing up. Right? This is the real gas problem, let me talk about it, right? So this is leaven, puffs up things. And the pride is the most dangerous thing, my friend. And this is what Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Your boasting is not good. Do not let the little leaven, leaven, uh, do, do you not know that little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Right, a little leaven can lump up, uh, like can uh, then puff of the puff of the whole dough. And there's one scripture in, in James that I always struggle with is God, why is God so against prideful people? He says God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. I always wondered why. Why does God resist and has nothing to do with prideful people? You know why? Every time somebody acts prideful, He reminds him of somebody who did that in the past. You know who that is? The devil himself. The reason for devil's fall is because he wanted to be like God. And every time we are prideful, it's a very dangerous ground that we're walking on, my friends, because this leaven can spread into our lives, and this pride can ruin us, and, and that's it. And God will resist you, and he gives grace to the humble. That's a very, very dangerous thing. So we need to be very careful about this. 
Then we move on and say, okay, I told you I'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, us and the leaven bread, the leaven in the house. I told you every year the Jewish people, every home, they go and they clear up this little leaven. You know, I'll tell you all the elements they use. A candle, a feather, a wooden spoon, a paper bag, and they ultimately burn the leaven in fire. What does the candle represent? Light. And Bible says, thy word is the light unto my path and the lamp unto my feet. With the word of God, this is what you do. The leaven in your house, talking in, within your body, within your house, literally in your house. This leaven needs to be cleared, my friends. If there's some junk in your house, you need to get rid of it. Biblically, that is right. God wants you to have an unleavened lifestyle. The candle, the word of God will lead you into all truth. It'll show you what the, what, what the leaven is. And you need to light the candle. You need to have Christ, the light who shines in the darkness. And once you, uh, you have the light, you have the feather. What does the feather represent? According to the Jewish culture, it represents Ruach, the Holy Spirit. With the word of God, with the help of the Holy Spirit, you clear this with a wooden spoon. They take a wooden spoon and put it in a paper bag. The wooden spoon represents the cross and the paper bag represents the grave. You got to put to death the deeds of your flesh. You got to put to death the deeds of sin and take this and burn it in fire. Judgment comes with fire. So you got to destroy the sinful lifestyle. And that's what this, this has a symbolism for. As you're born again believers, once you are saved, it doesn't end there. The problem is not life after death, my friends. It's already resolved. The problem is life after birth. Once you're born again, now what? Are you, are you willing to be a disciple who denies himself and takes up the cross and follow, follows him? That's what God wants. He wants you to have this perfect, blemishless communion with him. And that is very, very important. We need to put to death the deeds of the past. We need to put to death the sinful lifestyle. We've got to take away this leaven and start living a righteous life with the help of God. And this is what the scripture says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, behold, he's a new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. That's a promise. Sometimes I wonder why do I keep doing the same things that I did before? You know, I'm still in the process of sanctification. Before I was a, a saved believer, sometimes this, uh, this past haunts you again and again. But my friends, Bible calls me a new creation. This is a promise of God. Because my righteousness is not seen in my abilities. My righteousness is found in Christ. For, for in His sinlessness is where I count on. It's what I count on. Because my righteousness is like filthy rags. Bible continues to say in Matthew 12, 33, either make the tree uh, good or its fruit bad or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. A tree is known by a fruit. Any time you see the word tree in the Bible, it represents a human being. A tree is known by its fruit. What does that mean? A Christian is known by the fruit, by the life he produces. They cannot be a Christian and a drunkard. They cannot be a Christian and an adulterer. They cannot call himself a believer in Christ and a born again Christian and is fooling around with God. No, it can't happen. By his deeds, sometimes when you look at believers, you got to see the joy, the peace, the long suffering, all these attributes, the qualities of the Holy Spirit that Holy Spirit produces. And if you don't see these qualities, there's something wrong in the first place. First of all, it's not the tree of God himself. I met a youth pastor once. He was supposed to be a drunkard. I said, how can be a youth pastor be a drunkard? He said, no, no, we shouldn't say anything. He did his sinner's prayer. That's what they told me. But what about this Bible? A tree is known by its fruit. If it's a truly born again believer, where is his desire to live a sinless life? Where is his desire to long and follow Christ taking up his cross? Where is his desire to pray and study the word of God? Where is his desire to fellowship with other believers? There is something wrong in the first place. If that is not happening, my friends, you are not born again. You haven't tasted the true Christ. Unless you trace, taste the one true Savior, unless you experience the great sacrifice and redemption of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you will not experience this true communion. You will not experience this lifestyle that is filled with hope. You will not. See, sometimes when I look at Christians, I see them panicking more than unbelievers. Lord, we surrender our soul to eternity. Oh, Lord, we know we're going to dwell in your presence forever, but we are worried about the next couple of days because we don't know where the meal is going to come from. That is not Christianity. The sheep will follow his voice. Once I talked about the sheep, there are three things about the sheep. I tell you again, sheep are dumb. Sheep are defenseless and sheep are, sheep are dirty. 
We got to remember, if you want him to be the shepherd, we need to be the sheep. And we need to admit it. That takes humility to call myself sheep. Come on, you sheep. I won't take it well, but I, I am a sheep. I am dumb. Have you ever seen, uh, why don't you see sheep uh, guarding cattle or sheep doing some security stuff in people's homes? You don't see that. Why? Because they themselves need security. We are the sheep, believe it or not, my friends. And we follow a shepherd. And my friends, we, it's very important for us to, to be the follow, in order to be the follow, followers of Christ, we need to admit where we are. Unless you have the Passover, you cannot have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Are we compromising? Don't we feel the effects when we sin, when we fall? Don't you feel the pain? Don't you have the Holy Spirit convicting within you? There is a problem. The Holy Spirit is a convictor. He, bring, he leads us into all repentance. Very important. The Bible calls us we are aliens and strangers. When I landed in Canada, I said, we got to fill in an application. You're, you're an alien. No, I'm not an alien. I don't look like a lizard or something. Right? I'm not a green man from another planet. I'm a brown man. Yeah, that's right. Right? But here's the thing. The Bible calls us, we are supposed to be aliens and strangers. Don't gather and accumulate stuff here. This is only temporary. This is not your permanent address. We got to live like strangers. We need to have sinless life, lifestyle. Do not be attached to anything in this world, my friends. This world is not yours. The greatest treasures are in heaven. The greatest treasures are where you put your treasures in. For example, if you give money to a missionary somewhere in Africa or in Indonesia, if you're supporting a missionary there, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Learn how to put all your treasures in the work of the kingdom of God and you'll understand the delight. You'll understand the meaning of it because we are not home yet. We're still traveling, right? Don't be, are you homesick yet? I'm homesick. I want to go home soon. We've got to have that homesickness. We need to have the true homesickness. We need to get rid of this bondage. God wants to thrust us out of Egypt, out of this bondage, and he wants to deliver us into this new promised land. Our promised land is yet to come, and I'm excited for it. Completion. This feast, I told you, takes place for seven days, 15th to the 21st, seven days. And according to the tradition and legend, it says, when the Israelites left Egypt and they crossed all these places, and by the time they crossed the Red Sea and came to the other side of the Red Sea was at dawn of the 21st of Nisan. It took them seven days to cross the Red Sea. In this journey, we are crossing something. Unless you reach the perfection, number seven denotes perfection and completion according to the scripture, we need to travel until we reach our destination, my friends. From justification to glorification. Corinthians 5, 6 to 8 again. Your boasting is not good. Do not, don't you not know the little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out. This is the message for the believers according to the scripture. Now you read Corinthians, it'll make more sense. This is what it says. Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. I don't like to be called a new lump. But it's okay, Bible calls me a lump, I am a lump, all right? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has also been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That is the message. When you read Corinthians next time, you understand what unleavened bread is. I'm going to show you a little example in conclusion through a life of two individuals that existed at the same time and show you how the leaven travels, how the leaven spreads. Max Jukes, he was an atheist. Probably you ever heard about Max Jukes before? Probably nobody did. But anyway, he's not a popular guy. He was an atheist. Atheist, a guy who doesn't know God. He married an go ungodly girl, li lived a godless life. And this is what has happened. Through their marriage, this is what resulted. There were 310 paupers, 150 offspring of his were criminals, seven were murderers, 100 of his offspring were drunkards, more than half of the female offspring were prostitutes, and uh, out of his 540 descendants, they costed the state 
one and a quarter million dollars because of their crimes. The same time, they did research on another man of God, his name is Jonathan Edwards, and they did research on his genealogy of what happened to his offspring. 1,394 known descendants. This is man of God, this is what happened. 13 became college presidents, 65 became college professors, 3 became United States senators, 30 became judges, 100 became lawyers, 60 became physicians, 75 became army and navy officers, 100 became preachers and, m preachers and missionaries, 60 became authors of prominence, once became the vice president of United States, 80 became public officials in other cap capacities, 295 uh, of them uh, became of, of these college graduates were governors of states and ministers of foreign countries and his descendants never cost the state a single penny. A little leaven spreads through the whole dough. What kind of examples are you setting to your kids? What kind of lifestyle are we leading that will affect, that will pass my friends? Be careful what you choose.